I know lots of people that go to college do some excessive drinking, but there really is a clear difference between having some fun, maybe drinking a little excessively socially with your friends and alcohol use disorder. So in just a second, you're going to hear from Joe, who's going to talk to you in a very open, honest way about his experience in college and his struggles with alcoholism. And watch closely because as Joe tells his story, I'm going to be showing you the real criteria for alcohol use disorder so that you can see the differences in college partying and real life alcohol use disorder. And make sure you watch all the way to the end because there's some really cool pictures and clips that you're definitely going to want to see. In the beginning, it seemed normal um, just because, you know, I think everybody like me was so eager to kind of have that college experience and start, um, you know, going out on the weekends and, and doing all those things you hear of like what college is. Um, and then I think pretty quickly it turned to, you know, if I was going to drink on Friday and Saturday, I might as well drink. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, okay. Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. Um, and I think just because I was in college, it, you know, it seemed like, although maybe everybody else wasn't doing it, you know, it didn't seem like the biggest deal in right. the world uh, at the time. And then, you know, it just kind of progressed and progressed to where it was like, that was the only thing I really cared about. And it was just, how can I get to... Um, how can I get to the night where it's like, at least it's nighttime and okay. like I can drink, I can drink and, you know, just kind of be like, oh, it's just, uh, just unwinding at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah. How long before you were drinking most days? I'd say maybe for the first few months of college, I, uh, was kind of only on the weekends and then pretty shortly after that, it just kind of became, you know four days a week and okay. then once it was four days a week it was like well it might as well be five days a week mm -hmm. and then six and then I might as well just drink every night of the week. Okay. At what point in the story do you feel like it maybe went beyond regular college having fun? I think probably the whole time it was beyond okay. um, the college experience but I don't think I started to kind of see and understand that until I realized I was the only one that was failing mm -hmm. the majority of my classes. Um, the only one that, you know, would skip doing assignments because it was like, how oh, well, I want to drink. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, I could start to feel a riff with some friends where it was like, you know, I'd be, I started to become more of a, a nuisance than like actually uh, hanging out and having a relationship with these people. Okay. Um, so I think that was kind of my first... Um, look into that maybe it was becoming a more than just a college okay. experience thing. And tell me what you mean by a nuisance to other people. What are you what are you saying? I mean I would say that just their relationships and friendships kind of became uh, secondary to what I felt like my needs and my wants were mm -hmm. and you know my needs and my wants were drinking and used and then I wanted to do that first and foremost, and I think that, um, you know, a lot of times it made it easy to cross boundaries with people, um, you know, even if it was little things like, you know, I'm drinking, now I'm hungry, mm -hmm. it's not my food in the fridge, I'll eat their food, you know, mm -hmm. I'll say sorry in the morning, mm -hmm. or, you know, just uh, late hours of the night, TV on loud, just because that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of just, and when you're sleeping on people's couches too, yeah. it's like, you know. Um, you're just kind of like anything. their homeless college friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anything can be okay. a nuisance there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did they say something to you about it or you, did you just feel the energy or? Um, it took, you know, people would make, it started out kind of as a joke of like, you know, I even remember people being like, oh, Joe's the alcoholic. And okay. it was like, but at that time, in my mind, it was like kind of this funny joke of like, oh, Joe can drink the most, Joe mm -hmm. can, you know, I think in the beginning it probably felt almost like a badge of honor. Like a sense of pride. Like, yeah. Like I can drink you under the table. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, you know, it started to become less of a funny joke and more of like, I don't know, Joe, I think Joe may really be an alcoholic. Okay. The tone um, changes. Yeah. And then finally, I went on a trip 
to the national championship game in New Orleans and went with a buddy and his parents who I, I had gone to high school with him and knew his parents. Mm -hmm. And we went out and I just made a fool of myself. I had to get carried back to the hotel room, fell asleep in the hotel floor. Um, and I think, you know, it, it crossed a line where it was not only are you like, it's one thing to make a fool in front of yourself in front of us, but then like our parents, like, Dude, my parents are yeah, here. my parents are <laughs> yeah. here. Like yeah. this is the time when I need you to kind of like at least dial it back and control yourself. Yeah. Um, and then, so when I got back, that was like the first time that anybody sat me down and we're like, we don't really want you drinking, um, you know, around us. Dude, and, what did you think when they, I mean, what was going through your head? Uh, how can, who am I going to drink with other than these people? Um, and that's pretty much exactly what I did. I had, um, so you, Wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> so your buddy says, dude, like, we don't even want to be around you drink anymore. And you're like, well, damn, who can I drink with then? Yeah, I think, okay. I think um, you know, at that time, immediately I was like, my problem is that they, they have a problem with me. It's, you know, if they would just leave me alone about it, mm -hmm. really, it's their problem. Like, they're making a big deal about this one thing. Yeah. It's, they're being ridiculous. Yeah, okay. it's like... Could have happened to anybody. Um, Did you have moments in there, of like, like after an incident like this, or any of the incidents where you're like, "Dang, I really went too far last night." Or did you have little moments at all where you thought, "I don't need to let that happen again"? Um, I'd say the first time that I got a DUI, I, in the back of my mind, I think I thought, you know, I've, I've probably gone too far, but also, it was. Just an, an unfortunate thing, you mm -hmm. know, not not anything to keep me from drinking, but just okay. I need to, you know, watch my actions a little bit um, when I'm drinking, and that was all the the justification I needed to, you know, continue what I was doing. But with this false sense of like, well, I'll die. I'll I'll monitor myself a little mm -hmm. more. It's easier to kind of brush off things that you don't remember. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times I would wake up and I wouldn't see the worst of myself. Right. Everyone else saw the worst of myself, right. but because I don't didn't remember it and couldn't see it, it was kind of easier to just say, well, you know. Yeah. What I remember is like, yeah, sure, I'm drinking. <laughs> yeah, I had fun, I was drinking and, um, you know, the problems I caused them weren't really problems for me okay. as much as like a nuisance to them. And at that point, I think I was in a very selfish mindset of like, they can either get over it or, you know, I'll just go to different friends. Okay. Yeah. Plus there's this other thing with alcohol where it's like, everyone does it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Especially, especially in a college setting. Yeah. It would be really hard to decide you had a drinking problem in a college setting, I think. Mm -hmm because you could probably find anybody that's done any any of the things that happened to you. You could find another person that that's oh, happened yeah. to, right? Yeah. Okay. And I think that there's, like, it, uh, I can think of a lot of, like, family friends and even friends um, or just family members that everyone, it seems like it's normal that everyone gets a little bit too drunk one, one, every now and again. Right. You know, like, I can think about family members of mine that are not alcoholics, but at one Christmas party or at one wet, man, that was the time that they just went all in. Mm -hmm. So it's like, who is seeing you how many times? Right. And if you can spread the load out enough, everybody can kind of think like, oh, well, that was like maybe once a week on a Saturday, he goes hard. Yeah. But then a different person seeing you on the Tuesday night, but they're not seeing you on the Saturday. So the more you can spread it out, the easier I feel like you can hide within like the normalcy of drinking. Yeah. That's a good point, right? Because not, not, nobody has all the puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. Everybody has maybe like one or two of the puzzle pieces. Yeah. Okay. And it sounds like when someone does get all the puzzle pieces, they're like, we don't think you should drink around us. Yeah. You know, now pretty much everybody in my life is starting to catch on. Um, you know, my parents are, they're starting to pick up on the fact that like, you know, I got friends calling my parents saying like, he's blacked out here. Um, you know, we had to bring him back. We don't really want him here. Okay, um, well, I have to stop you again. Okay. <clears throat> to me, that's big. Because yeah. I tell parents all the time, I said, if your son or daughter's friends call you and tell you they're concerned, mm -hmm. it's bad. Because yeah. you're not going to call your friend's parents unless you are really 
Scary. worry for them. Yeah. So you're, so tells me your friends like were very concerned for real. For sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and in my mind it was like they just. They just didn't want to deal with my problems and like they should have been better friends and dealt with my problems. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> like if you're my real friend, you should deal with me on my worst. And right. So, so my parents catch on, you know, my parents start implementing like, um, you know, you can't drink here. Mm -hmm. um, and if I was, if they found cans in my car or bottles in my car or, or anything, they really wanted to sit down and talk about it, which only drove me, you know, further to like, you know, I'll hang out with anybody. Okay. <laughs> I'll hang out with anybody just to be like, not at my house and doing what I want to do. Um, what would you think when your parents would have a talk with you? I think for the longest time, I was just in the mindset of just, you know, if everybody would just leave me alone, then this would all be, my life would be fine. Like, if you guys would just, Get off my Quit caring okay. and just leave me alone. Okay. We would all be, we would all be, you know, living happily ever after. I'm doing what I want to do. Mm -hmm. You're, you're not worried about me. Um, and so I think that was really my mindset. Um, so then my parents decided that they were going to send me to see a um, substance abuse uh, specialist. Okay. She ran me through a list of questions and she at the end of it I think I'm, I'm not sure I think she said there was like 14 criteria mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. and at the end of it she said I met like 13 of 14 <laughs> uh, okay. I checked 14 or 13 or 14 boxes of what makes an alcoholic and I vividly remember walking out and looking at my parents and being like this lady is out of her mind <laughs> like this lady doesn't know me she doesn't know anything about me like how could she who is she to say that I'm an alcoholic? I'm just a college student. I don't know, and I, I um, you know, I think that was all they needed to really have the seed planted of like, okay, this is more than just, you know, he's really going hard in college. Right, it's more than just a phase. Or yeah. Okay. And so I kind of started, then started seeing um, a counselor and doing little things like I told them, you know, I'd. I'd do a breathalyzer to show that I could drink responsibly. Mm -hmm. and so I had certain times in the day when um, I'd have to blow, and really I just got better at, um, you timing know. Timing or something? Yeah, just okay. timing. It was, if I was, if I needed to blow at nine, I'd drink one beer at, at uh, 8.50. That way, you know, I would blow a responsible, mm -hmm. um, Okay, Res so you, you're sneaky because you weren't right. even trying to just go zero. You're like, yeah. let me show them I can drink, just barely have a level. Yeah. Oh, smart. And okay. so my thing was, my number would always be something that, you know, clearly I wasn't yeah. super intoxicated. and But I knew they wouldn't believe mm -hmm. um, zero. that I was, that it was zero. Yeah. So it was, let me just dial it back for until whatever time I need to blow, mm -hmm. do that, and then I'd be off and running. The dam breaks is yeah. on. Okay. Who gave them the 9 p.m. time? I don't, I don't remember if it was 9 p.m. I think it could have been later. Yeah, I feel like you want like midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., yeah. where it's like, truly, you can't drink like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd still have somebody wait until 1.59 yeah, to drink I, that one beer and then go hard afterwards. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or I think, you know, worse come to worse, I would have just said, oh, I was here, I left the breathalyzer there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure I did that a time or two. Mm -hmm. um, so now my parents are catching on. And um, then finally in December of 2020, mm -hmm. I'm watching a Clemson football game at a buddy's house and uh, an argument with my at that time girlfriend breaks out and I, at this point I'm well over the legal limit to drive and um, I mean I vividly remember everybody there saying like do not drive just just let it die like mm -hmm. calm down and I said nope I'm getting in my car got in my car get pulled over and immediately I knew I was like ah, this I'm definitely I'm getting done for now. I'm getting a second one now mm -hmm. um so get pulled over spend the night in jail and at this point it's like I, I really can't 
Um, I'm not ready to give it up, but at this point I have to start doing some of the things that like my parents really want me to do. Right, and back into a corner now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's when I agreed to do a 30 day program. Okay. Yeah. In the 30 day, I had somewhat good intentions. You know, I liked the idea of what they told me mm -hmm. in the 30 day, just, you know, you can really get your life back on track and... Did you consider at all, like when you were in the 30 day, did it cross your mind at all that you would be sober when you left? When I was in there, I was kind of in the honeymoon phase of like, you know, everybody's telling me, oh, how great it'll be. And mm -hmm. um, at that point, you know, I think part of me believed that. Mm -hmm. And I think that on a very surface level, I was like, yeah, I can, I'll, I'm going to do it my way. Like, I'm not, yeah. I hear all this stuff about AA meetings. I don't need to do all that. And I said, ooh, let's back it up to where, <laughs> let's back like it up to where it's I'm my, not, yeah. like, I'm going to live my life the same way I've been living it. But I like what you're saying of, like, if you don't drink, it'll be, it'll be better. I'm going to get my act together, but yeah. I don't need all them meetings mm -hmm. and stuff. For sure. Okay. <laughs> I think I knew before I left my house that as soon as I got my license, I was going to the liquor store. Okay. And so did that and then it was immediately back off and running the same way it was before I went to the 30 day. Back to the races. Yeah. I was definitely drinking alcoholically, but it was just, I knew no one else could know. Secretly, okay. Yeah. Can I ask you this when you said I was definitely drinking alcoholically, what does that mean? When you say that, what are you thinking? What do you mean when you say that? I mean, for me it was go to the liquor store and I'd say, I'd buy, you know, a fifth or something, and I'd say, all right, well, this is good for me to have this, because I I can, you know, I can just drink over three days, four days, whatever, and then, you know, immediately that night, I okay. wake up, the whole bottle's gone, okay. or wake up the next morning, the whole bottle's gone. I don't remember, mm -hmm. uh, don't remember it. I'd have people tell me, you know, you were telling me to come out and hang out, uh, at mm -hmm. three in the morning um, and so I think it was really just like not in control of my okay. actions and definitely not in control of like how much I was drinking. Drinking more than intended, that's yeah. one of those like mm -hmm. criteria. Yeah, Drinking that more, more than, than I intended. 14. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for right. sure. Yeah. Okay. Which I gotta point out, I think you only have to have like, is it like six or seven of the 14? It's so actually there's 11 of them okay. and if you have two, it's considered mild alcohol use. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you have two to four, or three or four, it's moderate. Mm -hmm. And anything over five is yeah. like severe, I think. Yeah, I think. So you were like, then I think I had 10 of 11. Yeah, okay. I remember being one short of like, okay. yep. This I worked with another guy who had 10 out of 11. He was like, that's pretty good, not 11 out of 11. It's like, you are almost double the amount you need to be a yeah. full fledged alcoholic. Right. Yeah. It takes a long time to build up to that level of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you were in the honors course. For sure. Just saying. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, the real like behaviors that had consequences uh, started creeping back in. Okay. And it, the, you know, it started with the drinking and driving and started with, you know, at this time I worked at a golf course mm -hmm. and um, you know, it started like creeping over into that where it was like, okay, well, I'll drink at work, but I'll, you know, I'll, I won't drink till I'm drunk. So it's like, you know, if they can't tell, mm -hmm. then it's no big deal. Okay. Um, and then my dad had just got a new boat and he already had a rule where it was like, if you're going to be drinking, like you can't take the boat out. Mm -hmm. At this point, you know, I'm telling my parents, I'm doing, I'm, I'm like, I'm doing this recovery. Like I'm, I'm going to these Clemson meetings, like mm -hmm. going to these meetings and kind of using um, that as leverage against them to get more, yeah. um, you know, more freedom. Mm -hmm. And so that night I, what I tell my dad is, um, hey, you know, I got my boss from work who he loves fishing mm -hmm. and you know, he's, he's not drinking mm -hmm. and I just think it would be fun to like go out and fish under the bridge. Mm -hmm. So now I, my dad, you know, he assumes he thinks me and um, this guy I work with are, are going fishing. Mm -hmm. So I, they come to my neighborhood and it has a boat ramp 
-hmm. On the end of it, I say, go down there. Uh -huh. I'll drive down, pick you up down there. Uh -huh. And so that way, you know, my dad doesn't see five people come down mm -hmm. onto the dock okay. when it's supposed to be me and a guy I work with. Okay, so, um, so they knew you were taking the boat. They didn't yeah. know, like, the yeah. story. I just yeah, didn't know if you were, like, sneaking in at in dark and, like, no, in the, it's trying funny. to quietly back the boat. Yeah, out. it's funny okay. because I definitely had done that. Okay. I mean, there were plenty of nights where it was 2, 3 a.m., and it was just, I happened to know where the boat key is, mm -hmm. and it's just... Can I sneak down there, get it off the boat lift without them hearing me? Mm -hmm. um, so there definitely was that, but in this particular one, it was I had made up a story of I'm going fishing with a guy, and I need I need this, I need friends. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want me to not have friends, right. and you know this is something cool I can do with a friend. That's um, sober. Yeah, that's sober, and and meanwhile I think I had been golfing earlier in the day, mm -hmm. drinking. So I'm I'm I have already been drinking. Okay. Uh, before that, go out, and so now I have all these people on the boat, and we can't get the boat lights to work. Mm -hmm. um, we go out. I think you know all of us are smoking weed, and we're uh, doing you know normal college kid stuff, and they don't know how bad my um, you know my drinking and like the decision making I have. Um, while we're out there and Clemson has two big dikes and so none of us are paying attention and then all of a sudden I just hear the boat stop and I don't know what I don't know what's going on we I turn the engine off everybody's screaming at this point um, and my buddy had gone off the front and he was he was laying there and luckily he's fine, nothing really serious, but, um, you know, in my mind, he gets up, gets back in the boat, I know he's alive, and then at that point, uh, one of the girls calls 911, mm -hmm. and at that point, I'm like, I gotta be anywhere but right here. Mm -hmm. um, so, take off running, and I don't know what my plan is, my plan is just, I gotta get out of here and I'll figure it out, um, and then... Uh, call one of my buddies and say, hey, you gotta pick me up from down the road, whatever, you know, I just gotta figure it out and then we'll do something about it. Luckily, my friend has the sense to call my parents and then once, once I see my parents calling, you know, I know, like, they know. You're done for now. Yeah, and, yeah. and at this point, it's like, you know, where am I going? They know it's, they're, they, they're gonna know it's our boat. Um, yeah. You got, there's nothing to say at this point. Like, I'm yeah. just, there's no tap dance you can pull out. No. Like, yeah. And wow. At, and at this point, and, you know, I had kind of doomed myself because to kind of get pity from them, you know, I'm saying, like, I don't know, maybe, like, a sober living would be good for me because it's like, I don't know, I'm just scared. I don't want to do it, but, you know, maybe it would be good for me. And, so now I've put all these ideas in their head. They've got, oh, I'm yeah. dead to rights. You're back in the corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, you're done. I'm dead to rights. Mm -hmm. And I think part of me was in a way relieved, just kind of that it felt like it was over. It, did it hit you at this point that I do really have a problem? Like, did it? I think I had known. Okay. I had known for, you know, I think my denial wasn't so much that I had a problem my denial was more in the fact that I thought eventually I'm gonna figure it out okay. and I'm gonna figure it out without sober living without going to AA meetings oh my. You know, all these people that's yeah. great for them I'm too smart to mm -hmm. to need that mm -hmm. I'll figure it out on my own mm -hmm. and you know a part of me did want sobriety mm -hmm. but then I think there's so much fear of like there's weirdly comfort in the chaos mm -hmm. of like as chaotic and terrible as it was it was it was like that toxic codependent relationship of mm -hmm. like I need this and you know no matter how bad it is like this is still my best friend right and like I'm really accepting that like maybe sobriety was okay. gonna work or be the thing for me okay yeah you know? What scared you the most about the idea of getting sober? Um, I think one, as much as I wasn't having a normal college experience, a part of me like craved that. Mm -hmm. And, 
you know, I just thought, well, if I get sober, you know, although I've already created all the, like, I've already shown these people that, like, I can't drink with them anyway. Right. You know, a part of me thought, like, well, I'll never, I'll never have fun again. Like, right. now it's going to be me and a bunch of old guys in AA, and I'm not going to have, like... You're going to miss out on everything. Yeah, I'm going to miss out. How am I going to go to football games? How am I going to go... I mean, are you even old enough to drink at this point in the story? Yeah, I would have been 20... Two, okay, 20, so, yeah, yeah, almost 22, I think. Okay, so barely, but yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. So the majority, I would say, like, it was about... But, I mean, you have to be thinking, like, yeah. I'm 22 years old. I can't, mm -hmm. like, For say, sure. I'm never going to drink again. I mean, oh, that's, yeah. like, massive. Yeah, I think okay. that was another thing, too. It was, like, forever is way too much to comprehend. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't see myself... I don't see this lasting forever, and if I don't see it lasting forever, there's no point in me doing it at all okay and um so i think my fear was just like all the things that i love to do i love to do when i'm drinking right and if i'm not drinking i'm not gonna love to do them anymore right and because one of the things that happens one of those criteria is once you you know you fall into an addiction you lose the capacity to experience joy and happiness from other things for sure so the idea of sobriety for someone who's in it it does seem like, dude, I don't even know if I want to live that life. Like, that just seems mm -hmm. like it's awful because you're imagining that you won't enjoy anything ever again. I'm guessing. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, for sure. I think that I just, like, you know, I thought it's going to be impossible to make friends mm -hmm. um, because that's what people my age do. We drink and socialize, and if I can't do that, then there's no way I'll make friends. Right. Now, Lucas, is this sort of close to the story where you come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, okay. we're, we, we just arrived. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. So I'd love it if you tell from your perspective. So we got all the lead up. Yeah. What? How do you guys come into the picture? Um, so I meet Joe right around that time. Um, comes to sober living. And, you know, I think this guy is full of crap from the day that I meet him. <laughs> can just see that he's good, you know, he's, you know, he's very charismatic, he's got the charm, he's saying all the right things, but you, you just, you know, you get that feeling. Um, so he's talking the good talk when he he's comes talking in. The, he's talking the good talk enough, um, his intentions and motivations. You got your sketch out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But also, I mean, the perfect guy we work with, college age, getting into trouble, real deal alcoholic. Not like just got in trouble one weekend and maybe it's an overblown thing. Like oh yeah, he's at the, the right the, place. The track record's the there. Yeah. This is yeah, like, this is made for this situation. Like this is firmly one of our guys. You yeah. Know? yeah, one of us. Okay. Yeah. So then we we start to get into it. So you go and you sober living. So you have to go and live there. Mm -hmm. So I think when I got there, you know, one of my biggest like hurdles was that because fun was such like a big part of what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. It was like, now I'm in this environment where it's like me and a house full of guys that are about my age and we're kind of in this controlled environment where we can't really get into too much trouble. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when I got there, it was like, well, this is like, you know, this is the perfect place to like, just kind of have fun and with no stress of like, getting in trouble and but i think that there was the like because i had that mindset a lot of times i like missed out on the bigger point of like what i was doing so then. just like you know what let's take little a little vacation, vacation yeah. from this whole mess I, I need to take a step back get my thoughts together and yeah. have a little fun on here at the recovery resort okay mm -hmm. yeah. okay you know a lot of people say they have like this spiritual like moment where it all changes um but i think for me it was like just kind of little pieces of the puzzle along the way whether it was like um just somebody said the right thing that like mm -hmm. hit me in a certain way or you know i think i'm not i don't really like confrontation mm -hmm. but i think there were like a couple moments where you know i was confronted on something and it was like i had now had a little time of like not drinking, not using, to where at least my brain was starting to function like a normal mm -hmm. person again. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that those little moments of like confrontation with whether it was like a staff member or another guy kind of showed me that like there you can have 
relationships and um, and I think it was just piece by piece over you know the six months mm -hmm. um, that I spent there that I started to at least feel like all right maybe this is gonna maybe this is gonna work for me and I guess one thing that always kind of stood out to me with Joe and the time he was in the house was like I feel like I struggle a little bit with um, like authority and like rules and like very like black and white and he liked to kind of hide in the nuances and the gray of it, you know, yeah. just like, well, I know that rule applies to these people for that reason, but I'm kind of different. And most of the time he'd kind of have a case of like, okay. you know, I don't think he missed a single morning meditation, you know, always did his chore, definitely had the mindset of just like, let me do all my stuff so that I don't have to be talked to about anything. Mm -hmm. And so it would kind of be true, you know, if like if there was anyone to give an exception to, it might be him. Mm -hmm. But then also trying to kind of maybe counter that mindset of like, you know, while there may be a case for you being an exceptional person, that doesn't always mean you're going to get the exceptions. And the rules are the rules and, you know, they're okay. all what they are. Because I remember letting Joe do, you know, online school in phase one. You know, at some point when guys leave, you hand in the keys and it's like, hey, now either like do it or don't. Right. I'm no longer here to you know, hold you to these things or make sure you go to meetings or talk to your sponsor or do whatever. Right. And I think that for Joe, I always worried a little bit because of that, like, trouble part of when the trouble goes away, does the drinking come back in? Right. And I think as I saw him get closer and closer to being out of the trouble and fully having that behind him, the more confident I felt that it was real and, and that he had gotten a big enough chunk of it and like a, a taste of this in his life that it was working and things were better, that it was like, it's not worth going back. What did you see that made you feel like, no, I think he's really getting it? Um, I'd say for him, probably the biggest one was just like staying plugged in, um, plugged in with staff, like with David mm -hmm. and me and Cole, um, would stop by the office and say, hey, and I mean, the other thing with Joe that sometimes like I have his number is because he's so much like me. And, and when I went through sober living, I got way, I got along way better with the staff than I did my peers. Okay. And when I was coming back to, to the house, I was coming back to see the staff. My mom always told me that Lucas said to her, like, well, you know, we just hope that, like, after a little bit of time, maybe he'll see that even though we were, like, authoritarians to him, um, mm -hmm. we always had, like, his best interest in mind. And I think in my mind, I was like, Phew. Losers, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nerds, and then it was like very shortly after, it was like I did find myself back up at the office, mm -hmm. did find myself spending more time up there, and then it was like when you kind of when you get out and you kind of have a little more freedom and you start to see them as like your peers mm -hmm. less than somebody in charge of you, you're like All right, I kind of like this guy, yeah, um, yeah. and I think that friends mm -hmm. who had long-term sobriety after the fact right and I think that was one of my biggest resources from it um, and then I think like the easiest best part was just getting to be around people with the same goal as you mm -hmm. whether it was guys in the house or staff um, and going to meetings and because you know in those first 90 days you do 90 meetings and mm -hmm. the odds that somebody like me goes to 90 meetings and doesn't hear something that they relate to right. or somebody's story where you're like, hey, that sounds like me a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you see that same guy drive off in his Porsche and his life is great. And mm -hmm. um, you think to yourself, you know, well, I guess maybe there's something here. Yeah, maybe there's something to this thing. Yeah, okay. so. Have you ever been on YouTube and seen Lucas's story? So if you guys haven't seen Lucas's story, then I'm going to put it right up here for you to click on and you can and you can watch and listen to that. It was a lot of years. Mm -hmm. A lot of painful things happened. Yeah. So you guys can check that out. And if you want to learn more about Greenville Transitions, I'm going to put the link in the description for you. And I'll also link it right up here at the end of this video. So you can click it and learn more about Greenville Transitions. And then last thing is, what are you doing these days? So I am almost done at Clemson. Uh, I got just a few classes left and then I'll graduate. And right now I'm working um, for somebody who's in recovery too. She owns a um, environmental consulting company. Mm -hmm. So doing that while finishing school mm -hmm. and once I graduate, we'll see what happens from there. All right. That's a 
get in until the start. <laughs>